Hello, everyone. Welcome to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm your host and their daughter, Heather McDougal. Today, like every Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific, we are going to answer general questions. I have dozens here that people have emailed me, and I know many are going to come in the chat. So hello, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. Nice to have you here. Hi, it's nice to be here. Yeah, it's really, every Sunday night, I tell you, we get a chance to meet some new people. I hope for, hopefully we're meeting new people, people who, you know, are just tired of being sick and ugly. That was pretty, that's pretty gross to start out. Yeah. Well, like, just sick and not feeling well, you know? I mean, yeah, well, you know, but sick and ugly, I think is more to the point. You know, Heather, I just can't believe. No, I guess I shouldn't start out that way. I should start out on a kinder foot. But, you know, you see people out in the world, they still look at the ideal as far as the human form as something trim and muscular. And, you know, it, regardless of how many people are overweight in the advertisements for your bank and your lawn furniture and so on, you know, I, I realize they're trying to appeal to their customer by putting in models who are, you know, kind of, kind of plump. They look more like the typical American. But, but that's not, person. that's, I, I don't believe we've lost the ideal of, of, it, you know, of being trim and, you know, having a few muscles on you as being attractive. Well, and looking healthy. I used to go, you know, when I do some of these TV shows, Mary, that I did, there, there was a, a, a group I ran into quite often who uh, dealt with, they, they were supposed to, uh, they were anti-fat chambers. All right. Okay. okay. And they, they would come into the meeting room with us and they'd argue how fat is beautiful. And I, you know, okay. But, but I still don't get it. I, mean, I, I can't believe that the general public, public doesn't look at, even though that 80% of people are either overweight or obese, doesn't look at this as a, a negative in terms of health. In terms of attractiveness, yeah, but don't you? I'm not. I'm not that old and blind yet, am I? Well, but I think it's more like um, the people just don't look healthy. It's not <laughs> only attractiveness; it's, they just don't look healthy. Well, really. but but health is attractive. But they look pale and sickly, and so yeah. Well, see that you're 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 designed such that you attract healthy people. You attract healthy people in reproductive relationships because you want to share your sperm and your eggs to make the most fit offspring possible. That's natural. That's survival. You want to you want to associate yourself with healthy people because healthy people work harder. They work longer. They work smarter. You know, they they you know, just in general they've had more opportunities in life because being overweight has held them back, the other people. So, uh, health is attractive. And you want to do what you can to be healthy looking so you attract other people in business, in, in reproductive relationships with families, et cetera. Anyway, but that's not how I was going to start out this whole oh, talk. What well, I was going to talk, start out was I started out by talking about Gila monsters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So tell us about Gila monsters. Well, well, you said you had pictures of them. You knew Gila monsters. I don't know what Gila monsters are. Do you know what Gila monsters are, Heather? Oh, yeah. The boys had a, a book. And that had a Gila monster in it. Oh, so <laughs> we used to have a pet that was called a uh, skink. Skink. And I, I, I sort of picture a Gila monster looking like that. Yeah, sort of like a, not quite a lizard with all the little, or an iguana, but a little flatter topped back. I don't know. Um, well, why, but, would, why would Gila monsters have anything to do with our topic tonight of good health? Well, because you you because always have to discover new things. In my effort to <laughs> discover Ozempic and uh, Bieta and the other drugs. Is that another diet? That's another one, yeah. I can't keep up with them all. I know. But there's a whole bunch of these uh, uh, glucagon-like peptide agonists, peptide 1 agonists. Ozempic could be an example of it. And you ask yourself, wh where did all this come from? Well, that's where the Gila monster comes in. <laughs> they come from the venom of a Gila monster. That, that's where they, they originally came from, is they, the saliva that was used to, to, well, you know, to kill to, the prey, to get them ready to eat. 
But my question was, who in the world ever decided to find out what was in the venom of the Gila monster and how it would help people with diabetes? I don't know. I don't know how they, that connection. I have to figure <laughs> that out. But did that's what that's where those Zempic, that's the origin of those kinds of drugs is the poisonous venom of a Gila monster, which goes back to my point: the way these drugs work. <laughs> Costing you like as much as fourteen hundred dollars a month as they make you sick, they poison you. <laughs> and you know, and they talk about there's something I really didn't get. You know, the story of these diabetic pills is this: six major studies have been done on the aggressive treatment of diabetes. Only six, okay, six, six have been done, and three were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in two thousand and eight, where they aggressively treated diabetics. And what they found is they increased the risk of dying and of dying of heart disease. In fact, they had to start the stop the ACCORD study 17 months early. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute stopped the ACCORD study 17 months early because of an increased risk of dying and dying of heart disease in the ACCORD study. Okay, so the <laughs> FDA got a little upset with them. <laughs> they said, look, you guys are getting approved for drugs that just lower your blood sugar. There's more to diabetes than just blood sugar. There's like dying of heart disease and strokes and getting cancer and gangrene and all kinds of things. Don't you think you could make a pill that at least cause people to, look, to be healthier? Okay, so they had this task out there. And the task was to find diabetic pills that not only lowered the blood sugar, but also cardiovascular risk factors risk factors like cholesterol well, and it, blood pressure. You said cause them. So it wouldn't cause those. You mean that would be... No, these new drugs, they, they invented. the FDA said in 2008, you know, you guys ought to start making drugs that caused an improvement in cardiovascular. Well, you can say improvement. Ah, okay. Thank you. All right. All right. So anyway, they got together and they picked on Gila monsters <laughs> and they found drugs that caused you to be sick enough to lose weight. And guess what happens when you lose weight? You lower your cholesterol, you lower your blood pressure, you lower your blood sugar. So the benefits that they're showing, which are like in the one to 2% reduction in cardiovascular risk factors are caused by weight loss. You get the same results if you would feed somebody cancer chemotherapy drugs. They would get sick, poisoned, like you know, monster venom. <laughs> they would get sick. And uh, they would stop eating. And guess what? Their cardiovascular risk factors would improve. Whereas in the old drugs, the old drugs uh, made you eat more and gain weight. You know, like taking insulin shots or taking uh, sulfonylureas. They produce insulin, which causes you to gain weight. So what would happen? Your cholesterol would go up, your blood pressure would go up, your risk of dying of heart disease would go up, et cetera. So the thinking was... If we could make our patients sick enough, <laughs> they'd lose weight instead of gaining weight. And yes. that's, by the way, how metformin works, glucophage. You know, glucophage is prescribed solely. I know your doctor thinks it reduces your risk of problems, but it's solely because it's one of the few drugs that causes weight loss or did before we have the new ones, the Gila monster drugs, <laughs> the Ozempic. So... And anyway, the, the FDA got mad at the drug companies. The drug companies have responded. They made drugs that instead of costing you pennies a pill, cost you thousands of dollars a month. And uh, and now they've become popular for losing weight. You know, metformin could have been a popular drug for losing weight among diabetics. It was. That was the reason doctors prescribe it. Well, at least it doesn't cause them to gain weight. That was always the pitch for my colleagues. Doesn't do anything else positive either. It may increase the risk of dying of heart disease, but it doesn't cause them to lose weight. It causes them to become nauseated. That's how it works. They become nauseated. That's how these other drugs work. You, you don't want to eat. That's how chemotherapy works. Ladies and gentlemen, there's something wrong here. I have to believe that, you know, the only way that you can maintain a trim weight is to be in pain, suffer from hunger, make yourself sick, which you can do with low carb diets. That's how they work because they make you sick too. <laughs> or you can do undergo bypass surgery. And I, I won't tell you about my favorite bypass surgery. I won't no, tell them, I won't tell you that please, today. I'll wait till next, next week. week. Wait. Next week. 
I'll tell you, my, I, t- I, t- I told you, I told you my Gila monster in my Ozempic stuff. Okay, I gave you that that hint there, and look it up. I'm not joking. I told you that part. Now next week I'm going to tell you about what bypass surgery can be equated to, uh, equated to uh, stomach surgery, bariatric surgery. I've got a cheaper way to have a bypass done on you, real cheap. <laughs> Doesn't cost you anything. <laughs> You do it yourself. <laughs> so you have to tune in next week to hear what that is. Remind me next week. You know, Heather, we, we have a couple of answers. We, we gave the answer on flaxseed last week that it does lower blood pressure. You know, and I told you that I don't think you oh, should okay. be taking flaxseed oil. You know, if you want to take flaxseeds and try it fine, but it shouldn't be the pain approach. The other answer that we didn't give was whether or not these aluminum cans were coated. And Mary went and looked that up. and They, they are coated with an epoxy. Um, all aluminum and tin cans are all coated these days. But the problem is, is that some of them um, are still coated with something that- uh, Plastic material. Yeah, plastic material. And so you have to be careful. I need to be careful. I need to be careful. Because they have to say on the can, yeah. if it doesn't contain BPA. Oh, yeah. It'll BPA, say, it's, a, it's, a, it's a known to cause cancer. Yeah. yeah. So that it, it says on the can, or it's somewhere on the- yeah. Because it's coated in those um, shelf stable boxes okay. that tomatoes come in and that vegetable broth comes in, and they'll say right on the box um, does not contain BPA. Would they say that on the, on the top of my it, soda water cans? I don't know. You have to start looking at the cans, folks. But it says but they're supposed most to be coated. Cans that you, you buy tomatoes in and things like that. So uh, uh, I bet if somebody does a review of it, they'll find some problems with it. But unfortunately, you know, it's the kind of thing where you look at all the options, you decide where you're going to take your risk because, you know, the world is risky. Well, it doesn't um, even the plastic bottles that water comes in. Yeah, that has that has that has uh, plastics that break off that are carcinogen and also cause premature sexual development. Or so that's why we used to buy our, our fuzzy water in um, glass bottles. We uh, used to. Yeah, that we always bottles. we always bought in glass bottles, always. Or we did, drank regular plain water that didn't come out of the tap that went through a uh, Aquatru. We have an Aquatru now. Yeah, Aquatru. Yeah. Yeah, we have a desk, desktop uh, filtering system on ours, and we also have a Sierra water tank. So we we're pretty confident our water is clean. You want to eat, you want to drink clean water, folks? It's not just Missouri that has water that's undrinkable. Or Mississippi. Mississippi. Is that where it was? Mississippi. Mississippi. Anyway, Michigan, uh, there's, there's been Michigan, Michigan too. Yeah, Michigan, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, there's the water supply is, you know, you, you, can't, you can't trust it. You have to be careful. And, and like I say, there is an option, a reasonable option. And that is you can buy clean water or, or filter your water. It's a simple option. One you, most people can afford. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's see, lots of questions coming in the chat and quite a few about cancer. And I think I, I have cancer on my mind because you were just giving your cancer talk. We're still in the middle of our 12-day course. And so um, we were just talking a whole bunch about cancer. And this first question came in from NJ. Curious of how plant-based diet can help reduce the recurrence of hairy cell leukemia. Well, I don't know that it does, but let's hope it does. Uh, Nathan Pritikin, in one of his reports, he got different diagnoses, uh, lymphomas, hairy cell leukemia was one of the diagnoses. Uh, oh, that's what he had? That's what, he, uh, well, that's what I always believed he had until I read some other autopsy reports. Nathan Pritikin is one of my mentors. Uh, he's somebody that uh, Mary and I knew personally, uh, somebody that taught us a tremendous amount. He's you know definitely one of my heroes. And he uh, got uh, hairy cell leukemia. And uh, most people who die from hairy cell leukemia die within 10 years. And he lived like, you know, 30 years with that diagnosis. So he did what pretty well. What's the difference between hairy cell oh, leukemia I don't know. and regular? I, I'm sure it's when you look at it under a microscope, the cell's got hairs on them. I really, I'm not joking. I'm, really? I'm, 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 that's all I remember is you look at them under the microscope and the white blood cells look like they got little hairs on them. That's what you call oh, hair cell. I, I will stand to be corrected on that one. But yeah, so I don't know. You know, I think you ought to take the attitude that your body is your best healing mechanism going. 
without that being in top shape, you're not going to heal anything, not even a scratch. You know, you're, you're going to bleed to death from it if the body wasn't up there and stopping the bleeding and healing. So you've got to keep those mechanisms as, as, as tuned and as perfect as you can be, no matter what's wrong with you. And so I would take the attitude that, uh, that you have hairy cell leukemia and you're going to look at the chemotherapies that are being offered and decide whether you want to take them, because I'm going to tell you, you've got to look at that research carefully. Uh, there's some good done and there's a lot of harm done with some of the regimes that are out there. So make sure you're a good consumer if you have such a problem. No doctor's going to ask you what you eat anyways. What do you care? It's not going to be a point of contention when you walk in the doctor's office. What did you eat today? Do you ever hear that when you see a doctor? What did you eat today? Of course not. They don't know. They don't care. They well, should. Most of them don't know. Most of them don't know. So I'm generalizing again. Yeah. I show, I, you know, I love to show the fe February 13th, 2015 report from the American Cancer Society, where it said, that doctors should provide for their survivors of breast cancer, in other words, or cancer, not just breast, yeah, colon, prostate, yeah. melanoma, et cetera. Doctors should pro pro provide for the survivors of cancer education prescription for a plant food-based diet, starches, unrefined grains, fruits and vegetables. Stay away from meat. They said that. And dairy. And well, I'll add that, yeah. Well, they I, I don't, that too. They say, well, high fat dairy. You know, it, they, if the American Cancer Society knows it, then you best believe that it's pretty well known. So whatever kind of cancer, even even if you have, <clears throat> uh, even if you have lung cancer, one of the things that first stepped out for me as far as this being important is, is uh, if you compare the American smoker with the Japanese smoker, you find that men. In Japan, smoke at a frequency of about 60% of the males smoke. And whereas, uh, you know, much less than that. It was, and now it's down to about 20% in those countries smoke. But back when they collected the data, it was probably 30 or 40%. And the difference in survival of lung cancer due to cigarette smoking was four times greater, better for the Japanese male who got lung cancer. Why? Because because they have uh, an immune system that's not being impaired by all this fat, all this animal food, all these poisons. They have an immune system that can defend and repair better. So you're putting in this noxious substance, these poisons from the tobacco. If you're in good health, you're going to be better able to defend and repair. And in this case, is one of the first examples that I was aware of. Four times the risk. And people who eat a low-fat, starch-based diet of dying of lung cancer compared to people who eat the Western diet. So anyway, the American Cancer Society knows this. You ought to know this, whatever it is. And of course, you know I'm a broken record. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm probably going to tell you the same thing, pretty much. Okay, thank you. This next, next question was emailed in from Don. His recent blood test showed my his ADMA was at 143, and his doctor said even though his cholesterol was only 140, that high ADMA was a risk for heart disease. What do you think? Oh, I, what I think is I have to look up what an ADMA is. Well, <laughs> you know, Heather, it's, uh, total cholesterol is enough for me to make decisions for my patients, the total cholesterol... But what has happened is since we started looking at cholesterol, which was, you know, when I first started in medicine, we then found out that if you put it through a centrifuge, the lipoprotein, which is how the cholesterol runs around, it runs around fat and protein and cholesterol and packages called lipoproteins. If you put them in a centrifuge, you can centrifuge them out into high density, medium density, and low density lipoproteins. So then we started looking at the risk of dying of heart disease, depending upon these fractions, HDL, good cholesterol, medium density light protein, kind of medium, and LDL cholesterol, bad, bad cholesterol. And we found out there was an association between the different molecular weights based on centrifuging of the cholesterol molecules. So we got into that fractionization. And then they found something called lipoprotein, lipo, lipoprotein A and B, and that became an issue. And then it was particle size. And that became an issue. And it's gotten to the point where 
you have to you have to do full time study to keep up with all these fractionations. You don't need to know this. You total cholesterol is enough to know to make decisions. And uh, the problem is this: is that when you start looking for details, you find excuses to get out of changing your diet. Like for example, you go to the doctor, your total cholesterol is 350. Doctor says, yeah, but your good cholesterol is 130. So that means I don't have to change my diet, doc? Yeah. Or you change your diet to the diet I recommend, say, you know, no cholesterol, low fat, and you drop your cholesterol down to 150. And, you know, everybody should be thrilled because that's an ideal cholesterol level. But the doc says, yeah, but your good cholesterol is now only 25. And good cholesterol is socially less hard. Disease. But doc, don't you understand that when I lower total cholesterol, I lower all fractions of cholesterol. So the bad, the medium, and the high came down. So you ask the doctor, well, how do I get the good cholesterol up? The doctor says, eat more meat. That'll raise your cholesterol. Why? Because you raise your total cholesterol, which raises all fractions of cholesterol. And so be with all the other fractionations they're talking about. Is they're just looking for ways for you to buy a different drug, have an attachment with them because they're the smarties. And uh, and if you want for you to get out of changing your diet, oh my goodness, my total is 350. By my little AMDA, it's got sparkles all over it. So it's fine. So I don't have to change. I need pepperoni pizza tonight. Total cholesterol is enough for you to know about. The rest of it is just basically a way of chunk of, ch of churning out money in the medical business, the laboratories, the drug companies, et cetera. And curiosity, you know, everybody wants to be the smart one who discovers something new. It can't be too important. I couldn't find it on Google. Oh. All I could do is find a, um, a stock called ADMA Biologics. <laughs> I hope we didn't invest in that one. <laughs> no. Because <laughs> that's those biologic companies that, right. that are buying all these drugs for uh, autoimmune diseases. And one of the things I, you know, I, I tell you, I, I sit next to Mary and she's constantly watching the ads. She, <laughs> she likes the pretty pictures. Like, I don't know why, but she's figured out that they give drugs like, you remember one of your favorite drugs? Oh, Rimvoke. Rimvoke. That's Rimvoke. The one. Okay. One time Rimvoke is treating ulcerative colitis. The next time it's treating psoriatic arthritis. The next time it's treating, uh, uh, I don't well, know. I got, I got a new one I saw the day, Sky Rizzi. Sky Rizzi. That's is, another one. Is now treating something else. <laughs> um, they all, from what it used they're, to be. they're all the same. They're all the same immunosuppressant drugs that block your immune system. And then they follow with 90 cents of seconds of commercial that tells you, oh, and by the way, you have a higher risk of getting cancer and dying of infections because we just knocked out your immune system. They don't tell you that. They do for 90 seconds, but you know, well, you that's it. That. Well, you, you, that. you don't hear it. That's, that's because now- I hear it. Well, I know, but what what everybody sees are the, are the Pretty pit pictures. Yeah, dancing on the flowers, they're going to have fun. Happy, and you know. After they're they're showing them, and they're all thin the people too. No, not always anymore. Not anymore. No. No, well, but they got they got to make it an appealing ad. So, uh, especially as I've tried to explain to you, especially then there is a huge big alternative that's fixing the food. It, you know, even if you believe me a little bit. I'm worth paying attention to and at least a trial to see whether I'm telling you the truth. You know, you don't have to invest a lot. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to invest much time. I've told you, if you don't get better in four months, you're not likely to get better. It's not something you're doing that's mean to animals. You know, you're not contributing to planetary warming by what we recommend. Why wouldn't you do it? Just give it a try. And then go listen to somebody else's point of view. If you're still sick, which you probably won't be, you'll get rid of your type 2 diabetes. Your balls will start working. Your joints will stop hurting. Guess what? You figured out what the problem is. It's the food. Thank you. Next question. This is from Lily. What are your thoughts about going to the dentist every six months? And do you think we should get a mouth guard for teeth grinding? Well, again, you're taking me out of my field of expertise. <laughs> you know, I'm not a dentist and, and I don't really follow the dental literature that much, but I can tell you about my practice. 
I, I would consider going to the dentist every six months excessive. Just like I consider taking routine dental x-rays excessive. Because in addition to finding cavities that they may be able to fix and make a difference, probably not. But they also, this is a, this is a cash register. This is a money-making machine. You know, that's, that's why you're being called back to the dental office every six months to get a cleaning. You're encouraged to get dental x-rays, well, I don't know, every year or something. Yeah. But it creates business. Anyway, uh, I think you should take good care of your teeth. You should, you should, uh, I hate flossing, but you should <laughs> use interdental, yeah, inter I, I use interdental brushes. They work really, really good. They're little brushes you put between your teeth and brush your teeth. And I think if you're going to eat sugar, you should brush your teeth and rinse your mouth off if you do. The sugar it, it encourages bacteria to grow that are bad for the enamel and they cause cavities. You lose your teeth. So, uh, but I do think the medical, the dental business must be treated as any business. And that is that their number one goal is to make, keep the doors open. Anybody who thinks differently is naive. They've got to keep the doors open. They've got to keep shoes on the babies. Just like doctors. Just like everybody else. Yeah, they've like got, everybody else, you're right. <laughs> the primary goal of a business is to make a profit. And then you get to stay in business. If you have tools that don't work, that do more harm than good, and you're pushing those, which is being done in the medical business, and I would guess the dental business, some of the things that go on, then, then you shouldn't be forgiven. If, if you mistreat your customer, you shouldn't be forgiven. But, you know, as I've tried to tell you, uh, if you've known me for 46 years, I've been telling you the same thing. I've been telling you, what you think you're getting from the medical business is, is going to fall short. There's going to be more harm than you expected and less good, far, far, far less than more. But, um, you know, you want to know their opinion and you want to see what the medical business has to offer because sometimes they have some pretty good things. Where they don't, but you ought to just be a good consumer. You, know, you ought to find out what's... You know, find out well, these days it's easier to be a good consumer than it used to be because you can look everything up um, on Google and um, at least read other opinions. I've got a website too. I wish I could give it to these folks. I'll try and remember to do it next time. Okay. I have a website. Uh, I, I uh, am a, 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 well, I have been an associate professor for medical schools. I'm still on two of them and probably the other two. I don't know. Anyway, I, I take care, I teach medical students. We have medical students at our 12-day program right now. So um, I, I used to feel it was really important for me to have this association with the medical school because I got access to their library. And otherwise, you have to pay like $35 for just one article. You know, I'd, I'd go broke just doing <laughs> one paper for you. So I have had this association with universities all for 30 years, more. Well, there's actually a website which anybody can take advantage of. And this website uh, provides essentially more papers than I can get from the university. You basically get anything and everything. And the argument of this particular website is that uh, you paid for the research. It was your government dollars, in many cases, or your consumer dollars that pay for it. You ought to have access to it. And so they've been running without without anybody taking them down for a long time. I don't think they're going to be able to take them down either. And um, anyway. Well, I think I'll, I'll make a note so you can share that next time. Yeah, you know, I can probably look it up too. <laughs> so anyway, go, go ahead. What's the next question? Ed? Okay, next question. What are your opinions on orthorexia nervosa? You have to tell me what that is. Oh, um, man. I'll give you the website. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'll look for. I'll look up. Or well, I know. I know what it is. It's it's being afraid of everything to eat. It's being it's being a a, a neurotic about like me. I'm one. <laughs> is that right? It's, it's 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 being afraid of of anything but meat and dairy and eggs. Basically, is what the people who promote that term. Orexia. Do I have it right? Okay, here's the website. Yeah. Orthorexia is an unhealthy focus on eating in a healthy way. Yeah, that's what see. You got to get name. You got to find out names. You got to if you don't if they're not out there, you got to invent them. 
so you can take care of your, your foes. It says eating nutritious food is good, but if you have orthorexia, you can obsess about it to agree I to a it. degree that it can damage your overall well-being. Well, you know. <laughs> is that you, Dad? <laughs> that orthorexia it comes from the, the point of view of the observer. You know, yeah. It's in the eye of the beholder. And I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that think I've got the, I do. Yeah, it's even under WebMD. Yeah, well, let me give you, let me give you that. Under Volsa. Let me give you that website. You ready to write it down? Okay, it is uh, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash. And here come the letters. It's SCI, which I assume stands for science, SCI. And then there's a dash. And the next word is hub, H-U-B. So sci S-C-I dash hub, H-U-B, period, S-E. I don't know what that ending is. I've never seen it before. But I'll give it to you one more time. It's S-C-I dash H-U-B, period, S-E. You can go there or just look up the Sci Hub website, S-C-I dash H-U-B, if that website doesn't work for you and you'll, it'll take you to it. You can go there and it, if you figure out the correct title or the correct DOI number, you can put it in there and honest to goodness, articles pop up that I never thought I could get from any medical library. It's amazing. And you as a consumer, if you have access to this power, this knowledge, you need to take advantage of it. You need to take somebody like me who has orthonovexia, ortho, ortho, yeah. ortho whatever, Sia. <laughs> I got something, Sia. Orthorexia. Orthorexia. And you need to find out whether I'm telling you the truth or not, or I have a right to be fanatic about this. You know, out me. Is this where you found out about the Gila monsters? Yes, yeah, matter of fact, I got the Gila monster right on. <laughs> but uh, it made me, that's right, these drugs, GL, GLP 1 agonists. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ozempa. So, it was, it was, Ozempic? It was Ozempic, yeah. Are there, you know, I got to take them right down all the names these days. Really, I can't catch all right, I'll, I'll keep track of them for you. Anyway, they're there. They come from Gila monster venom. <laughs> hey, how come they don't put that in their advertisement? We make you so sick you can't eat, and therefore you lose weight. And for a lot less money, you could take cytoxin, adriamycin, and fly for a cell, which we gave to our can can breast cancer patients. A lot cheaper. And you'd lose a lot more weight because you'd be a lot sicker or just as sick. <laughs> it's bizarre. Okay, let's go back to questions before I get kicked off the air. <laughs> okay, this next question is from Cindy. What are your opinions on potassium chloride as a salt substitute? She's uh, worried she eats too much table salt. Not a good idea. Not, not a good idea. Potassium chloride is called no salt used to be very popular 30, 40 years ago when it was, when, when the, the main villain, villain of the Western diet was salt. That's all you ever heard about, salt. You know, and that's all the doctors were taught in medical school is you need to prescribe a low salt diet. Or we were taught to switch from butter to margarine. That's all we learned in medical school. Well, salt is a necessary ingredient, nutrient. You, you have a taste bud on the tip of your tongue for salt. You're supposed to get these minerals in. Too much of a good thing might be a problem, but it's a lot less problem than you can imagine. The body tolerates sodium chloride so well, but it doesn't tolerate bacon. It's the pig that's the problem. It is the packages that salt runs around in, like cheeses and cheese whizzes and et cetera. It's a bunch of greasy animal-laden foods. That's how you get 70% of your salt in your diet. Okay, let's get back to potassium chloride. Potassium chloride can put you into a fatal heart rhythm. I had this almost happen to a patient of mine whose wife got enthusiastic about making spaghetti sauce with potassium chloride. And she put the poor guy in the, in the hospital because it raised his potassium level so high. This is not a normal, natural thing to do. It tastes terrible too. Don't bother. You know, if you need to be on a really low salt diet, adjust to it. And only a few people do. People with severe heart failure have lost like 90% of their heart or certain kidney disease failures, kidney failures. Uh, maybe maybe if you have terrible edema, which I, it usually has to have a cause, 
But otherwise, you have every reason to not be on a low salt diet. You main one being you like this, you like salt. You, it'll make you like the food. If you don't like our diet, it's because you didn't put salt on the food. Put well, you don't. You have to also um, signify how much is too much. You don't recommend we just that people just pour salt all over everything. No, I don't. I think I think there's some reasonable amounts of sodium. Uh, our diet has 500 milligrams of sodium in it. Our diet with a half a teaspoon of salt has 1600 milligrams. There are 1100 milligrams of sodium in a teaspoon of salt. So our diet with a half teaspoon of salt has 1600 milligrams of sodium in it. If you go to the intensive care unit of your hospital and you're dying of heart disease, their low sodium diet is 2000 milligrams, which is 400 more than ours. What we do is recommend a little sodium on the surface of the food. Most of you, I can even make the argument that you'll do better than being on a no salt diet. But I think uh, in, in this case, salt to taste, change your taste in the direction of lower salt, because that's what everybody teaches. You know, I think it's flawed teaching in large part, but I don't, want, I don't have time to go into all the details as to why. But I, so I certainly know it's overblown. It's the, it's the pig, not the, not the salt and the bacon. It's making you sick. So anyway, uh, what we do is we recommend use a, a half a teaspoon of salt on the surface of your food daily. And that's, that's a, a lot of salt. That's a lot of salt. Yeah. If you make, mix it up in the pot, you're going to lose the flavor. So don't use no salt. If you truly okay. have to be on low, low salt, I was going to say, you truly have to be on a low salt diet, you need to learn the Kempner diet, which is a diet of fruit, fruit juice, white rice, and table sugar. And Walter Kempner used to wash his rice to get the salt off of it, the sodium off it. I don't know if that ever accomplished it, but he used to get people, you know, like 300 milligrams of sodium a day. You need 50 milligrams of sodium a day to stay alive. And under those profound restrictions of sodium, you can see some really remarkable things happen to some very, very sick people. And so if you're one of those very, very few people who really needs a low salt program, you look to Kempner's work. He was uh, at Duke University for seven decades. He was the, the financial success of Duke for two <laughs> decades, the rice diet. It's a big deal. Okay, thank you. Uh, you talk a lot about high blood pressure and that the only medication you like is chlorothaladone. So John's wondering what the dosage is. His doctor prescribed it for him, but won't tell him how much to take. <laughs> Okay, well, you know, 10 milligrams is a lot. But they only come in pills of 10 milligrams. So, you know, I would start out with somebody with, with five milligrams of chlorothalidone a day. You know, that's that's where I usually start our patients. And it goes up to, uh, you know, I, I hate to give you doses because you're asking me to remember <laughs> details that I, you know, I want to be careful on. But you look it up. But I, 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 the doses that I would often give are five milligrams. You have to break a 10 milligram pill in half, but you can take a lot more than that. And what you wanna do is you want, if you're gonna do it to treat high blood pressure is you wanna check your blood pressure. And these, this is the parameters you wanna use is your goal blood pressure should be 140 to 160. That's the top number over 90 to 100. Higher than that, higher than say 160 over 100, sustained for months, not just for a day or two, but for months. Higher than 160 over 100 is associated with adverse consequences that are not corrected by medications. Strokes, heart failure. The problem is, is if you aggressively treat high blood pressure, you decrease the perfusion pressure to the heart and the brain. With these low artificially created pressures, like below 140 over 90, you increase the risk of strokes and heart attacks. It's called the U-shaped curve of mortality. So it's really tough for a doctor to hit this goal window, this target of uh, say 160 over 100, maybe 140 over 90. I've got to get you in that exact level. Can't get you lower than that. Can't, don't want you higher than that. Boy, oh boy, this is a tough job. You know, that's why it ends up being just kind of a guess as to what will roughly keep you 
in this range. And it's it's not hard for the patient or the doctor. What's easy is to get you in a situation where you don't need any drugs. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, that we accomplish in nearly 90% of the people, according to our published data on our program, uncontested. We get 90% of people to reduce or stop their medications, and particularly their blood pressure and their diabetic medications. Unpublic or published data, up for criticism, involving 1,703 people. And there's another study which shows similar results that was done independently. Of us. Two other studies show similar results. And you always recommend that people take their blood pressure at home because yeah. a lot of people, um, white, coat syndrome. white coat syndrome, when they go into the doctor's office and they sit there and they wait to have their blood pressure taken, they get all nervous and excited. And by the time their blood pressure is taken, yeah. it's higher than it would normally be. Oh yeah, most of us have that. Yeah. And also if you're a drinker, alcohol can raise your pressure pretty, mm -hmm. pretty profoundly in some people. And you wanna take it at home when you're relaxed. Get yourself a blood pressure cuff that costs $25 to $75 for an automatic reader. And just check your pressure. How often should you check it? Well, if you're okay, I mean, if you run normal pressures, maybe once a year. <laughs> how, how about if you have are on medication or you're worried about your blood pressure? Well, maybe, maybe once a week, maybe twice a week. You know, certainly not every day. Good grief, that just ruined too much, too much of your day. You want, to, you want to get some general ranges uh, over a period of months. That's what you want to treat, if you're going to treat. And the best way to treat it is to fix the problem. The problem is that the food causes the cardiovascular system to develop peripheral resistance to flow. So the heart tries to beat out blood, and all your blood vessels are clogged up with, with blockages and spasms and sludging that occurs. and so. The heart's trying to pump into this vascular tree, which goes throughout your body. And it, it meets resistance and it must get nutrients to your tissues. And so the only option it has is to raise the pressure to get the nutrients to your tissues. Well, the proper response, which should be to re remove the peripheral resistance, to make the, the blood vessels nice and elastic, to get rid of the blockages, to stop the sludging, which occurs an hour after you eat a fatty meal, animal fat or vegetable fat, your blood just clumps all up. So you stop doing that and guess what happens? Your pressure drops precipitously. And that's why in almost all cases, when you arrive at our, at our clinic, which you will by the internet these days, we're gonna stop your blood pressure medications, likely day one, all of them. And what we're going to do is we're going to find out how you do over the next several days under doctor's supervision. There's not something you're doing yourself under board-certified doctors. What we're going to do is we're going to see whether or not you really need this medication, and that would be based upon the readings you get afterwards. If you don't stop it quickly, then you could develop hypotension and fall over into your mashed potatoes. Make a mess. I won't do that. Okay, next question. Um, what causes brown liver spots and how can we get rid of them? Okay, those are skin spots. Uh, brown, those brown spots, you're talking about liver spots or skin spots. I don't yes. know. I don't know, maybe, maybe. Aging, right? They're, they're aging spots. I don't have any, though. I do. You do? Mm -hmm. I got, mm -hmm. well, there's some there. Look. Well, you're probably old. I'm, just I'm probably kidding. old. Yeah, I guess well, she is a year older than you, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, too. She's 76. Man, I'll get some next year. Uh, you don't have any. I, I think what, what I would guess is this, and you, you, you can probably find a better answer. In fact, maybe I'll be stimulated to look it up, but probably not, is that uh, some of this brownness comes from hemorrhage uh, into your skin, which uh, leaves hemoglobin, which gives you a brownish color to your skin. I shouldn't have that. I've been eating this way for years. But also sun exposure. Oh, well, that would You know, you, you get dark spots on your skin because of the pigment that you lay down from sun suntans. You got yeah, a lot of that. I got a lot of that, yeah. yeah. I didn't get the sun damage that on my face that you did, but no. I got sun damage other places. I, I, I was invincible at one time from the sunshine. And I spent, <laughs> I spent four years on an ocean-going sailboat. Should, should have worn a hat. 
Okay, thank you. Next question. What is the bigger risk for a heart attack, food or stress? Oh, oh. <laughs> absolutely no question. But I think the oh, best sure you could answer this one. Yeah, I think the best proof is but they want proof. Yeah. Best proof from this came out of studies of what happened in Europe during World War One and World War Two. Uh, during uh, World War One, World War Two, there was food shortages, particularly in the area of rich food, meat and dairy and butter, etc. So the diet changed more to a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. During the war years, World War One, the death rate from heart disease precipitously dropped. New cases of diabetes just didn't happen, or multiple sclerosis, and people with diabetes and MS. They stopped having attacks or problems that caused them to go to the hospital. It's because of this forced change in diet. And then between the two wars, the, well, this is a war. This is like people shooting at you, putting you in gas chambers, burning your homes down. You talk about stress. And when the good times returned and the stress went away, guess what? The heart disease came back. And I think that's probably the best current evidence as to the role stress plays. The way I look at stress is this. It's a normal, natural part of life. I, I have a lot of it in my life, and I enjoy most of it. It gets the job done and the problem solved for me to be under some stress. You want to ruin my day? You put me on a beach with a book. You'll ruin my day. You know, uh, stress uh, is, is the motivation to get you to get the problems resolved and the jobs done. It's a natural norm. It's called trials and tribulations. He says what it's called 2,000 years ago. Yeah. I don't want to give me any religious talk, but I know, a few of those, I know a few of those verses. I can't understand you. Okay. Anyways, trials and tribulations. Paul used to talk about that. So anyway, uh, you know, I know for some people that stress is so terrible that it really does affect their lives. They can't eat. They, you know, can't sleep. And then there's a, a few people on the other end of the spectrum, just as happy as can be. But in between, I'll tell you, as a doctor, I can ask you pretty much anything you'll tell me. So I've gotten to know people pretty well over the last you know, 50 years. And I can tell you, most of us are just the same. We have problems. But you know, as they say in the military, you just put one foot in front of the other and just keep chugging along. And it seems to work out. So I would uh, certainly, I, I wouldn't blame, all, all, I'll tell you another thing stress does for you. It, it causes you to, to abuse yourself. When you're under stress, you have an excuse for smoking more cigarettes, drinking more alcohol, and eating more of your favorite pizza pie. And, and, then, and then when the stress is over and the job is well done, you've got to celebrate. Anyway. I, I, as long as you don't turn stress into destructive behavior, I think it's okay. If you're going to turn it into destroying yourself with your bad habits, it's not such a good idea. I don't know what you do about it. You know, go to church, you know, play sports, exercise, take yoga. I don't, I don't know. I don't, don't take tranquilizers and don't resort to alcohol. I can tell you there are any drugs. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, uh, not pleasant sometimes, is it? No, but it's the food, as you always say. <laughs> fix the food, fix the food, and you'll be amazed at what else is taken care of. Okay, next question. This is from Jay. Uh, can uh, What plant foods are good for BPH improvement? None, Heather, unfortunately, none. Uh, this They're talking about benign prostatic hyperplasia. And there's an article on my website. Uh, you go to Hot Topics and then medical topics, and then benign prostatic hyperplasia. It's due, I believe, to the Western diet causing overstimulation of the prostate, but it lays down scar tissue. And so by the time you get to the point where you're symptomatic, which is like urinating eight times at night, and by the time you get to that point, it's already too much scar. So the way to treat it is there is some component of the prostate enlargement that seems to be a little bit reversible. And you take things like uh, like uh, saw palmetto or bisisterol, uh, which are uh, plant hormones. Uh, you could take those or you can take drugs called... Uh, Flomax? Flomax, thank you, Mary. Flomax. 
the alpha adrenergic, alpha adrenergic blockers, and they're supposed to work too. And you could do uh, uh, behavioral things like not drinking water before you go to bed at night. That helps a lot. Giving up coffee causes a lot of urination. Coffee does. And then the last resort are what we call minimal surgeries. There's a maximum where they cut your prostate out and you're going to regret having that done. It's called a TERP. But if they can do it with minimal surgery like uh, ultrasound or lasers, I think I have a new splinting technique out that I'm not familiar with, but you know, I'd have to look into it to see whether I think it would do more good than harm. But yeah, you, you restrict the water in the evening. Try saw palmetto. Try bisisterol, which uh, I probably should spell for you, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's sterol. They're plant sterols that you, you you look up and go to Amazon. You look up prostate, and you find a whole bunch of stuff. Unfortunately, a lot of the stuff is mixed up with things that I don't recommend, like zinc and vitamin D. And, and polyunsaturated fats. Try and get yourself something that's pretty, pretty close to the plant, the soft palmetto plant. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Next question: um, Is stevia okay to use? All right. Oh, uh, stevia is um, a leaf of a plant that they grind and purify until it looks like um, a white powder of sugar. It's a sugar substitute, but it's very, very sweet. So it's, I, I don't even know, like a hundred times sweeter than- 200 times. 200 times sweeter than sugar. Molecule per molecule is 200 uh, times sweeter. Well, so you only need a little bit of it, but it, it tends to leave kind of a bitter aftertaste. It's very difficult to cook with and it is very irritating to some people's intestinal tracts. And so they get bloating and cramps and uh, um, gurgly stomachs. And, and so we don't really, um, it's not something that we recommend as a substitute for sugar. We just recommend that you use a little bit of sugar on the surface of the food. Um, but if it doesn't bother you, um, I, don't, I don't really see any harm in it. The benefits you're gaining are small. You know, sub to substitute a teaspoon of sugar, that's 16 calories. You know, you eat 2,000 calories a day. How could that make a difference? And you might as well enjoy the sugar. The, the stevia will leave you wanting as far as enjoyment goes. So uh, most of you... There's no carbohydrate. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So most of you would do it, except, you know, these artificial sweeteners, Mary, they... They cause uh, the brain to register as sweet, even though they're not, no calories. Mm -hmm. And they actually raise insulin levels, which pushes fat into fat cells. So a lot of the artificial sweeteners are actually are really poor at losing weight when you, when you take them in. As I say, they're, you know, it's, it's inconsequential, 16 calories of sugar. In, and well, I think why sugar got a bad name is because people were talking about drinking you know, these huge um, sodas that had 20 ounces of yeah, sugar yeah. that had so much sugar in them that, um, you know, all your calories would be sugar for the whole day. Anyway, the, you, you, you know that this isn't health food. A, a big soda pop is not health food. You know that. Okay, here's a good question from Dave Can you be better at 70 than you were at 60? Oh, I don't know, Heather. You know, I. You know, you know how old people get philosophical. I guess <laughs> uh, we, we've earned the right to do that. I, I, I think the thing that surprised me most about being in my mid seventies is just how much life is enjoyable. You know, Mary and I, Mom and I, are just having a wonderful time. It's different than before. Before we used to fly airplanes all over the world. <laughs> before we used to uh, have a, a couple sailboats. We sailed all over the Hawaiian Islands. You know, I we used to be a lot more active than we are now, but, but we're sitting in our mid-70s. But we still do pretty much everything we want, and we, we get along probably as well as we're ever getting along. You know, <laughs> they call it the golden years for, for some reason. Sleep better than I ever did before. So I'd have to say there are a lot of positive things. Uh, I'll I tell you just one other thought. It's always troubled me when I was younger about 
how can people stand to reach the last years of their life? And let's face it, folks, you know, how do they adjust to that? Well, you know, what I've found, and I think Mary could tell you the same thing, is it just kind of happens. You know, we realize that, you know, we've got a few <laughs> few years left and that's it. We've got a great life and it just doesn't seem to be all that troubling to at least me. And, uh, you know, I, if I if I get to be, uh, you've heard it, if you, as long as you can function well and think well and be, make a contribution to your family and society, then you belong to be here. Once those days have passed, then it's time for you to go. <laughs> well, I hear from our patients all the time that they feel much better than they did, you know, after adopting this diet and change. Oh, yeah, and if, you, if you were at 60 and you were eating the typical American diet, and then at 70, you changed to a healthy diet, you would feel better at 70 than you felt at 60. Definitely. Oh, time. But remember, we changed in 1977. So it's been a long time that we've been eating this way. So I think the biggest change for me um, physically would be that I, I seem to get tired more easily than I did when I was 60, which was 15 years ago. Yeah. So that was a lot. But otherwise, time. I can do almost everything else I want. You know, the other interesting observation, we're kind of getting off topic here, is that <laughs> is that uh, in the first 15 years of your life, some pretty traumatic things happen. You know, when I think about it, where you started from day one and what you were doing at age 15, probably driving a car. Well, the years between, say, age 15 and 20 and, say, 60, 65, or 70, they don't, they don't go through that much change. You're still functioning in an adult world. And then when you get to be about 70, 75, then I think the last 15 years, you see a lot of change. And that's the kind of, you know, that's where we're at in life right now. It's at a time when when things are not, not in a great direction, but <laughs> where things are changing. And we want to delay that as much as possible. And we know how to do that. And, uh, you know, I hope that we are in a position where we can talk to you in 10, 15 years and say, you know, we've made the right decisions. I can tell you one thing. I lived longer than Robert Atkins. <laughs> <laughs> I'll live that sucker. <laughs> Well, and you lived well too. That's yes. you know, li living well is is key. That's very important. Yeah, well, I can look back and think about a few things I could have done better. So, oh, can't we all? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I did. I didn't know any better, Heather. That's that's most people's problems. They, I, I, they just don't know any better. And you know, once they learn, then they're faced with some pretty important things. To Isn't there a, a saying? That, that goes, you know, if I had known I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Yeah. I mean, people have to have said that for forever. So obviously, when you get to be a certain age, you look back and you think, well, if I had done things differently when I was younger, maybe I'd be in better shape than I am now. Yeah, well, I, I uh, hopefully that. for us, at least we start eating right oh. 50 years ago. And, you know, I was I was uh, uh, I was in the process of committing suicide. <laughs> with your knife and fork with my knife and fork and my tobacco tablet and my wow. few other bad habits i had yeah I, 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 those of you who know my history know that i i was almost dead at 30 90 pounds heavier than i am now i had a massive stroke at 18 had major abdominal surgery at 24 25 yeah i was i was pretty much ready to check out in my late 20s <laughs> early 30s now i'm still okay so we've got two. Oh, it's never too late. You got to realize it's never too yeah. late. I tell people that all the time when they send me an email asking me, I'm, I'm 80 years old. Is it too late? It's never, never too late. And the response is so fast. You know, it's not like you have to wait for months to see the benefits. It happens right away. You, you know, if you're ready to be, be fixed, then, you know, go for it. The information is free. That's why we're here every Sunday night at five o'clock. <laughs> that's why we're on a web website that's pretty much for free. And uh, anyway, when you get around to getting real serious about your changes and you need our help, this is because a lot of you do, most of you do. You're on drugs, you need help, you need medical advice, you need reassurance from board certified internists or board certified doctors then we're here to give it to you. We're here to defend uh, the way you want to take care of yourself. And, and that includes defending your medical care to your private doctors. So I do that all the time. 
Well, you always say that the body wants to be well and it never stops healing. You just have to feed it the right food. Well, food's a major problem. You know, other other people, like, for example, people who smoke cigarettes, that may be number one on their list to fix, to get their life back in order, or an alcoholic. You know, there, there are other problems that become dominant in your life. But for most people who don't have tobacco and alcohol problems, the, the biggest problem is the food. And by the way, you know, when it comes to other problems uh, you might have, the damage done in a society is far greater from by the food than it is by tobacco or alcohol or illicit drugs. It's, it's far more harmful in your family than any other drugs. It's far more harmful in the environment. And good grief, you grow tobacco, you, you release oxygen and pick up CO2. Same thing with <laughs> poppies, same thing with cocoa plants. They're good for the environment. You know? <laughs> So food is really the most detrimental thing for us personally, for our society, and for the planet. Okay, I think that's a good thing to end on. That's that's the hour. All right, well, it was good fun. We'll see you next Sunday night. Bring your friends and relatives and realize that our, uh, that our recording here is gaining popularity. So have people watch this recording or any of the others we've done and Get started. And you just never know what we'll talk about. You gotta <laughs> you gotta start people someplace. And when you introduce things to them, don't be surprised if you get some resistance, but they'll change. The ones that like themselves. Okay. We'll see you all next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Thanks oh, for being with us.